Good morning. Welcome to the online worship service at Living Savior. My name is Pastor Caleb Kerbis, along with Pastor Paul Zell and our pastoral intern, Jacob Ungamak. We are pleased to be able to share God's word with you in this way today. This is but an abbreviated version of what we provide in person every single Sunday in two locations. At our Hendersonville location, we have a worship service at 930 with family Bible time to follow. That time lasts for about 45 minutes. And then in our Asheville location, we have an 8 a.m. service, a 10.15 a.m. service, and then family Bible time in between from 9.15 until 10 a.m. We would love to be able to welcome you there so you could be part of this fellowship and this opportunity to connect with fellow people just like you who need to grow in God's grace and wisdom like we all do. Today is a brand new series entitled Wounds That Heal. Beginning with this Sunday and moving over the next few, we are going to see Jesus and the accompanying readings point out some hard realities for us. But the reason that God shares these realities with us is not so that he would cut us and leave us to die, but rather like a surgeon, he would cut out the things that need to be removed so that we would actually live. He would enable us to experience wounds with his words, but these wounds actually, although they might hurt at first, they would actually heal us in the end. Particularly today, we get to see that this door is narrow. This door to eternal life where we follow our Savior on the pathway that leads to our heavenly home. But it's not necessarily as wide open and as easy as we might think. No, it's actually narrow, following our Savior, that is. And especially in the sermon, we are going to hear that there are two paths that God is, is identifying for us. He's already provided the one that brings us true lasting peace. Why do, would we ever want to go to the one that leaves us on our own, dying and afraid? May God bless our worship in his name today. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we approach God and we claim that we are comfortable on our own and have nothing to confess before him, we are kidding ourselves, scripture says. Instead, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and he is just, and he promises to forgive us our sins for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, and also to purify us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, as we approach God now, let us humbly and quietly confess our sins to God, trusting in his mercy in his son, Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to live perfectly in our place, to die a sacrificial death on the cross to erase our guilt, and to rise from the grave to prove that we are now at peace with God and have life and forgiveness forever. Therefore, we get to bask in this reality, that God has washed away our sins and we are his children. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love that we may obtain what you promise and make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The New Testament reading for today, Hebrews chapter 12, will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who hear it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, the word of the Lord. In the gospel for today, Luke chapter 13, Jesus, once again, he has a hard word for us to hear. 
that although this door is narrow, we simply follow the one who opens it, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 13. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside, knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was considered to be the, one of the most deadliest climbing seasons on Mount Everest. Yeah, the tallest peak on planet Earth is, no surprise, considered to be the, one of the most deadliest. And in this season, in 1996, there was at least 10 people that died. See, there's a part of the climb that when you, you kind of get to a point of no return. Whereas people are climbing, they have to decide whether or not they are going to help you and go all the way back down to base camp, or they are going to, after all of their grueling training, try and make it to the top themselves. And so there's several people who are, who are lying there, and, and it's this terribly gruesome thought that you're there in a condition where you're not supposed to be alive at all, but you're going to keep on climbing, and there's somebody who's, who's lying there. Maybe he's, he's left behind, and, and the other people might come for him, or, or he maybe just fell behind. But then as the people are climbing towards the summit, you, you come across this person who's all alone. I, I would like you to imagine being in that scenario. That would be terrifying. That would be awful. You, you might be thinking, I would never put myself in that scenario. I have no desire to climb Mount Everest, thank you. Yeah, but, but, but pause for a moment. Just imagine what it would be like to climb any mountain. It could be Mount Everest. It could be even Mount Pisgah in terrible winter conditions in our neck of the woods. Would you ever want to climb a mountain, any of those mountains, alone? Where you knew that the conditions would be terrible, where you would be left by yourself, everything would depend on your strength and stamina. This world doesn't play favorites when it comes to the weather at times. Would you ever want to be alone? That's kind of the question that is put before us as we look at the reading, the New Testament reading from Hebrews chapter 12. We have two mountains in front of us. Two mountains that we can go camp right at the, right at the foot of either mountain. And we can see everything about those mountains and both of those mountains are ominous in their own respect. But as we sit at the feet of those mountains and even as we think about climbing those mountains, make no mistake, neither of those mountains are easy. Neither of those mountains are going to be a cakewalk. But when you think about climbing those mountains, what you have to ask yourself is, do you want to do that all by yourself and then you are left to the final result of whatever that is? I mean, it'd be like, it'd be like standing there at the base camp of Mount Everest and you know that the weather's going to be terrifying. It's going to be awful. It didn't matter how much you prepared. It didn't matter how strong you, you were. It didn't matter how much endurance you had. You're left all, only to yourself. Or you can climb another mountain. Let's say it's one of the neighboring mountains to, to Mount Everest. It's just as terrifying, maybe not as tall, but just as hard. But you have everyone with you. You have all the things that you need. You might say, I'd rather do neither of those things, but I'm pretty sure you'd pick the second one as opposed to the first one. So as you and I sit at the feet of these two mountains, we have a, a, a tale of two mountains of sorts. You and I are are led to ask one question. 
Are we going to follow the very arduous, challenging, and narrow pathway that our Savior has put before us, or are we going to go the road that is more commonly traveled in this world? In the end, what we are left with is either a pathway that follows our Savior or the one where we're, we only have to answer for ourselves in the end. You tell me which one you would pick. C consider these two mountains, not Mount Everest or Mount Pisgah, but consider the, the two mountains that, is being that are being described in this reading that I just shared with you from Hebrews chapter 12. The first one he describes is this ominous mountain. It's this mountain where there is th these loud noises, this thunder and lightning, where even if an animal touched this mountain, it would be stoned to death. And the reason that if this animal would touch a mountain, it would be stoned to death and not just grabbed and, and killed is because, well, first of all, why would an animal even need to be killed? Well, this first mountain is Mount Sinai, where after God had brought his people out of slavery in Egypt, he led them down to that southern peninsula where there was Mount Sinai, and there at the base of this mountain, they camped. And God revealed his glory in a way that terrified them. As the mountain shaked and the earth quaked, and there was lightning, and there was these loud voices, and the people were terrified. They didn't want to hear or see another word. I mean, for all the times that people say, man, I wish I could just see God, well, maybe you shouldn't ask that. Because these people did see God, and they didn't want to see any more of him. And if anyone or anything would touch this mountain, that thing, that animal, or that person deserved to die. And so the people knew it. So even if an animal would touch a mountain, they wouldn't even want to touch the animal. So they would stone the animal to death from a distance. That tells you something about this scenario. They didn't even want to hear another word, which is why they would say, Moses, you're the one who needs to go and speak for us. Because we don't want to hear him talk to us directly in this way. You go and be this mediator for us, because we can't handle this. All the people were terrified. And maybe you might recall what happened on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, this is the place where God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, a summary of the moral law of how God's people were to live and maintain proper heart desires and to think in this life according to God's demands. Not according to their demands, not according to everyone else's demands, but according to God's demands. Love the Lord your God above all things. Don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not uh, give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet or have these wrongful desires in your heart against all of these things that God has not given you, but rather find contentment in the things that God has given you. All of those commandments summarize everything that we could think or desire or feel or say or do and how those things need to be properly aligned with God's desires and not according to our standards. That's Mount Sinai. And so what do you have? You have this mountain where you are left with everything that points ultimately to you. You can go ahead and climb that mountain to God, but if you saw a mountain shaking and quaking as God would reveal part of his glory and holiness in that way, would you really want to? Not to mention he just got done bellowing out his commands of all the ways that you were supposed to live. And you and I know that not one of us could stand up to it. For even if we analyzed our thoughts alone when it comes to things like hatred or lust or coveting the things that God has not given us, who of us could even stand for a second under those standards? So would we want to go to that mountain? Would we even want to try to climb that mountain? Because at the end, everything points to you. You are left to you. Notice the name of this letter. It's the letter to the Hebrews. These Jewish Christians had already experienced what it's like to leave behind these old laws for this brand new comforting pathway that Christ had provided. It's not brand new in the sense that that it's brand new to the world. God had been promising to provide it, but it's, it's new to them and in history in that Jesus had just come, lived, died, and rose, and they had seen all of these laws and rituals fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one. And so leaving behind the, the idea that I have to follow all of these, everything's left to me, I need to do it, 
They're now following Christ. They were now experiencing hardship. We heard that last week. They were now experiencing what it's like to follow God even if they can't see everything. It requires a lot of faith. We heard that two weeks ago, the beginning of chapter 12 last week and, and then chapter 11 the week before. And so now, what are they going to do? The reason the writer to the Hebrews is saying, are you going to go back to this mountain, is why? Well, because for some of them, this is all that they knew. So this is a comfortable pathway. And you might imagine that, that for them and for their fellow countrymen, to, to go back to what you knew and what was familiar, to rely a lot on yourself, that, that's comfortable. It was even commonplace. This is what everyone else is doing. And who likes to face persecution when you can live life more simply and easily? Not only that, there's something else that goes on inside the human heart. And you could see it in these Hebrews, too. The reason why he's talking to them about, why would you want to go back to this place? Is because it begs the question that maybe there's something that, some type of desire that, that drew them to begin with. Not a desire to face punishment, although that was certainly pending. But because it's easy for the human heart to go back to this type of philosophy or ideology where everything is left up to us and we would rather follow that road that everyone else is also following too rather than following, as our gospel put it, this narrow road that our pathway, that, that, our, that our Savior has led. That this pathway that Jesus has laid out. If you go back to Mount Sinai, it's like, it's like this in our day and age. It's like relying on yourself to find your own peace and your own comfort. And you can have your own truth in life. I mean, after all, who can tell you what you should think to be true or not? Does that sound familiar? And finally, whatever you want or you desire in the end for yourself, that's really up to you. So you should really find your peace and your comfort and your satisfaction. You can validate yourself on the basis of the things that you accomplish. And by the way, you can do it. Does that sound familiar? You see, we don't have to stand in some Old Testament setting, as real as that was, in order for us to find ourselves in the exact same place. Spiritually, mentally, psychologically, even culturally, we still find it very easy to go right back to Sinai, trusting in ourselves to stand in this mountain, even though we act like it's going to be okay. We're blind to the holiness that is shaking everything before us. We are deaf to the loud shouts of God's punishment that are pending, that are right there in front of us. No, instead, in a world we are taught and told that we are to go it alone, and it's actually going to be better this way. What is more, there is not just something that is common about this. It is very comfortable. It, it goes like this. You, you can follow the pathway of Jesus, this narrow pathway, or you can go back to this other mountain. And in this other mountain, you don't really need Jesus. You see, to, to stand at this mountain, Mount Sinai, it's, everything depends on you. But since it depends on you, that means you don't need this pathway that Jesus has led to a different mountain. No, instead, you, you, you don't really need that. So, so you go to this other mountain. You, know, you don't really need to spend as much time paying attention to this pathway that Jesus has led out. You don't really need to pay attention to the things that he says. You don't have to grow in all of that. So, so when it comes to time in his word, time being in worship, time serving other people, I mean, you have so many other things that you need to do that really do depend on you. So to relinquish all of your time and priorities with your work and your job and your recreation and, and all of the weekends off that you just need to do so many other things, you're going you're gonna to sacrifice those things to follow Jesus? No, there's, there's so many other things that you need to do. So many other things that are way more important. You, you don't need that. You, you, you need to focus on yourself and all these other things that are much more important. Everything depends on you. Do you see how common it is? All of these things this dependence on ourself, self-reliance, this urge that we can accomplish it our own, not even just standing before God, although that's very much what he's referring to, but even this dismissal of following our Savior 
and being warned by these harsh words that this door is narrow, that we need to pay attention and not assume that just because we think so, that everything is hunky-dory with Jesus. This is an arduous road that we need to follow with our Savior. No, 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 it's way easier to set that aside and to just go it alone and we can get to some of that later. This self-reliance, this standing before the mountain, it is as foolish as trying to climb Mount Everest. It is more foolish than trying to climb Mount Everest alone in terrible conditions. So then why would we do that? The writer to the Hebrews, you have not come to that mountain. God didn't bring you there. The only reason God told you about that is so that he would unveil to you that that's, the, that's where this world leads. That's where our, our sinful nature leads. That, that's where our human condition, heart condition leads. It, it leads us there. God doesn't bring us there. He's just unfolding for us that in this broken world and in our sinful condition, that's where we're left. So he hasn't led us there to where there was this fire, this darkness, this gloom, this storm. He, he hasn't led us there. So, so do you want to go there? You want to go back to that? Then with a very strong contrast, rather, the writer to the Hebrews says, no, 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 no. God has not brought you there. Instead, he has brought you to a different mountain. If you'd look at a map of Jerusalem, before Jerusalem was built, there were these, there were these hills that were very close together. The most prominent one, arguably, was Mount, Mount Zion. This is where Jerusalem would be built. This is where God would come to dwell, first in the tabernacle and then in, in, the, in the temple that was eventually built by David's son, King Solomon. And in that temple, God's holiness would dwell as people would bring sacrifices and they would hear that their sins are atoned for and they would see it in so many vivid ways through those Old Testament worship rituals. But all of those things were pointing ahead to the ultimate Savior who was to come the ultimate sacrifice who would remove sin, the ultimate anointed one who would release God's people from bondage of slavery in this world and bring them to the eternal reality of heaven itself, a family that wasn't just connected by some genealogy in this life, but was given to all of us through the blood of Jesus, God's son, to make us his own dear children now and forever. That, that is the place, Mount Zion. That is where also very close to there, that is where God carried out the ultimate sacrifice of his son, where Jesus literally in history and in time was, was sacrificed on the cross for you and for me. And as a result, on the third day he rose from the dead, God accepted that sacrifice, and now what do you and I have? You, have? you and I have this full realization of everything that God has promised and fulfilled in Christ. It, it's this place, as he describes heaven, Zion doesn't just refer literally to this place, but to the heavenly Jerusalem that God has prepared for us all. We have this place where there's this joyful assembly of angels. I mean, imagine all of these angels surrounding God's throne, and what are they singing? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and glory and wisdom and strength and honor. All of these things that Jesus won, he now welcomes us into this reality. Yes, we even here and now, it's like, it's like climbing a mountain and there's this very narrow pathway, but we're following our Savior and we are singing the same song. We, we, we have our own Christian songs that we sing and we, yes, we sing them off tune and out of key in comparison to that beautiful throng in heaven. But make no mistake, we, we have that, that song to sing as we follow our Savior. We have this heavenly reality, this new covenant the, the old covenant was, was a quid pro quo, a two-sided. God would keep his end of the bargain, but we had to keep ours. Again, everything depends on you. But at Zion, we have the full reality of this new covenant where it is one-sided. God carried out everything in Christ for you and for me. What, what else does he say? There's thousands of angels the church of the, of the firstborn, this is a, a clear reference to Jesus who rose from the grave, the, the eternal son of God. And since he is the firstborn, he now gives to us this rightful inheritance that he has won for us through his life, death, and his resurrection. The, the first fruits from the grave, that's just the beginning of what God also gives to you and me as heirs of heaven. 
our, our names are no longer written in our own record book, where we, according to our own accomplishments and our own trophy case, literal or proverbial, we have to only look at whatever we have earned. No, this is a book that has our names written in it with more certainty, more historic validity than even the most ritualistic of people, like the Jews, who would keep copious notes on all of their relatives, reaching way back. Even greater than all of that, he says, your name is written in the, is written in heaven. In scripture, it refers to elsewhere as the, the book of life. That God has taken your name, unique to you, the one whom he has called to himself in the waters of baptism, the one whom he has fed with this banquet of joy in the Lord's Supper, the one whom he has filled in your ears and in your heart with his words of promise and peace, he has taken your name and he has written it in heaven. It's like looking at a crazy arduous mountain and knowing that although the pathway is narrow and it is very challenging, your Savior's with you. The summit is already certain. You know you have the reward. In fact, when you get to the top and you're going to leave your little memento there, no, no, far greater than that is that Jesus has written your name in heaven. So here's the story of two mountains. You and I have been given heaven. You have come to God, the, the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You and I don't have this carried out on our own. God is not calling us to follow a pathway perfectly. No, this, this is a righteousness that he's given to us by his son, Jesus Christ. And we have already been made perfect by faith in him and in him alone. So you have these two pathways. We, we can go back to this mountain where everything depends on you. Or we have this other one. The pathway that our Savior has led to, to this Mount Zion, this heavenly reality already won and secured for us in Jesus Christ. And you can't dismiss then the words that Jesus says when you consider your life. Verse 24 in our gospel, he says, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. This door is narrow. And we should make no assumptions that we have everything taken care of and we are fine on our own. We, we have no reason to act complacent in this life. We have no reason to be comfortable with pathways that lead us back to relying on ourselves. We have no reason to follow any footsteps that lead us away from our Savior and his word and to go back to anything else that we knew. We have actually absolutely no reason at all to walk away from this narrow door because we know that in the end, it is like being left on a mountain in conditions where we're not really supposed to live. In fact, we won't live forever and we will only face punishment and fire. There is heaven and there is hell. There's only one way that we get to heaven and it is through Jesus. So why would we follow any pathway that leads us anywhere else? The door is narrow. It's a tale of two mountains. So the question I have for you is, not only where are you? What has God given to you? What reality do you have? But also this, who do you want to go with you? Because no matter what you follow in this world, you will, you will be left only to depend on yourself in the end. And no matter how great or kind you are, no matter how successful you have been or the achievements you have accomplished, in the end you have only yourself standing before a mountain that is shaking and quaking to face a holy God that demands complete perfection. And then where will all of that other stuff that leads that way to Sinai give you? It'll only give you what Sinai gives. Death. God never gave Sinai to give life. He only gave Sinai to identify everything that we could never accomplish and why we ultimately need him to bring us to Zion. You have that. So then how seriously are you going to take this in your life? Notice that Jesus is talking to you. How many times in the gospel reading do you hear you? It's as though Jesus is looking straightly at you and saying you. Why, why would you think that you can be complacent about everything that you think you have done in this life. I, I mean, for me to even talk that way, even through a camera, it, it, it's kind of combative, isn't it? But isn't Jesus speaking that way? I don't know you or where you have come from. I don't know you or where you've come away from me, all you evildoers. 
Many will try to enter it. This door is narrow. God has given you this wonderful privilege of having his word right in front of you, of following this pathway and not being complacent about it, of pursuing his ways that he's laid out before you, of giving you a Christian community where you can grow in God's word and make sure that you are not growing too complacent. It's, it's like climbing an arduous mountain. You know you're going to be able to re reach it. Strength that has been given to you from on high. And you have a wonderful company of people who will be right there to pick you up along the way. Not to mention you have your God who is right there with you to carry you and help you with every single footstep. He's already told you that your name is right there at the top. Zion, in heaven. So as you look at your time and your calendar, as you look at your priorities and the places where you are every single week, what does that tell you about where you are going? What does that tell you about what you prioritize in your life? What does that tell you about the way that you act, about the, the pathways that God has put in front of you? To, to follow all of these advantages where ultimately it's all about you, the things that you get in the end that rely ultimately on you, or, or everything that points you to Zion this heavenly reality that has been secured. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, and every effort does not mean later. It does not mean I'll get to it someday, for there is no day that has guaranteed us. It means right now. Every opportunity God has given you to grow in his word, at home, at church, with fellow believers, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, God has laid forth this pathway of grace provided and procured in his son, Jesus Christ. Your name is written in Zion. And so we follow the pathway of our Savior, making every single effort. For everything does not depend on us, but rather it depends on him. And so we follow him in his word every day. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If there's any way that we can help you and encourage you as you grow in God's word, please do reach out to us. There are many Bible studies and opportunities for Pastor Zell, for our pastoral intern, and for me to reach out to you. We commonly will grab cups of coffee with people who want to learn more about their Savior with no strings attached. And if that is you, or if you'd like to jump into any one of our connect groups or our Bible studies, please reach out. We'd love to get to know you and to share God's grace with you. God's blessings to you this week and always. Take care.